to explain the system. Um, many east coasts of a number of countries, um, if you think about it, they generally seem to have shelving beaches and sand or soft conditions and quite a lot of west coasts are hard. So um, the screw anchor system got used on many, many east coast uh, of um, not just uh, England, but uh, stretching from India uh, all the way across to America. And uh, uh, we went on an investigation to see um, one of his original screw anchors. Um, this is uh, a picture I took in the uh, Chesapeake Bay Maritime Museum. And that's one of Alexander Mitchell's um, English made uh, screw anchors that was recovered from uh, the lighthouse that's actually in the background in this picture. Um, the problem with uh, screw anchor lighthouses is that um, when you get a lot of ice, um, all the individual legs, of course, get locked together and the ice tends to chop off uh, some of the screw anchors. Fortunately, not an issue that we hope to be uh, concerned with today. They also um, uh, used them to build piers and um, he had this uh, um, system where you uh, put some anchors in uh, and then um, use those as a base to build the next one. And uh, this picture shows his method of installing screw anchors. Luckily, we've improved it a bit since then. Um, so he has a team of chaps pulling on a rope and then what looks like a, a windmill in the picture is in fact his uh, capstan uh, with rope going from the spokes and then you haul on the rope and screw the anchors in. Um, that was the system used uh, particularly in India when they're building the railways uh, to install really enormous um, uh, screw anchors. So uh, the system has been around a good while. Uh, yes, another pier now. Um, this I think is Brighton Pier, which of course, um, uh, despite the attempts of it to burn down, still stands on its screw anchors. Um, and here's all the happy people uh, busy testing the uh, stability of the pier. Um, now this is the kind of anchor which uh, he uh, used. And in fact, if you have ever visited uh, HMS Belfast in uh, London's river, um, that kind of anchor is actually holding HMS Belfast in place. The Port of London Authority use um, fairly shallow but big uh, screw anchors to um, uh, achieve all their moorings. Now this video may or may not work, um, which doesn't seem to be. I may find it again in a minute. Um, but um, we've done uh, a number of tests uh, along the south coast in um, Corsand and uh, in Studland. And we use our handheld equipment. Uh, and this is another alternative, which is a barge which um, was made at Calstock. Um, they didn't have this mast on it at the time, uh, but they used that barge, which is trailable, um, to carry the piles or the anchors and then uh, install them. Uh, it's got four legs, so uh, it rests on the bottom, stop it twiddling around um, while a hydraulic motor installs the anchor. Um, here's uh, another representation of the barge folded down, uh, hopefully floating happily on uh, blue water, which is obviously a poetic license. I haven't seen any of that lately. Um, this is the installation kit uh, on the surface uh, because we use it to put in foundations for buildings and so on. Uh, you see, the critical point is that we have a fairly long tube, generally two meters long, with helix on it. And 
uh, it'll normally have two helices um, about uh, 800 millimeters apart on this long tube, two meter tube. Uh, so you screw that into the seabed. Um, interestingly, at Corsan, we actually went in four meters deep. The first two meters of seabed was pretty soft, um, which probably explains why people drag their anchors around Corsan, uh, apart from um, the seagrass, which um, isn't the grass you see in this picture. Um, now this kit can be used by a diver. Um, of course, and uh, a single diver managed to install four piles with it in one session. And that was the first time he'd done it. So um, what we do is attach an airbag to it. So the weight of the equipment, which is normally a real nuisance on, on the surface, is actually no great problem uh, underwater. Um, we used the same equipment at Studland to install and remove test pile there. Um, now you'd be interested in this, these are some pictures that I pinched from Australia. Um, they show um, a boat notable for uh, its need for new injectors, I think, because in the video, there's more black smoke than anything else. But uh, basically they tested uh, moorings that they'd already put in. Uh, so you've got a block and chain mooring um, and getting uh, 0.7 of a ton and it moved. Uh, the eco mooring, which is another word for a screw anchor, uh, no breakout, no moving. And seagrass friendly mooring, uh, which is the same thing, but with flotation on the riser. And uh, then um, similar uh, results in mud. <clears throat> um, so uh, already we think we can show uh, the dramatic improvement in holding capacity from uh, a screw mooring. We obviously have an issue. If you've got a few to do and the water's reasonably deep, a diver would be the practical answer for putting them in. If you've got a lot to do, uh, say 20 or so, um, then our barge, which we're currently working on, and which I'll just flip back to it, um, it fits on the trailer so it can be moved rapidly around the countryside. Uh, it carries the um, uh, anchors on board and um, for instance each one anchor can replicate roughly an eight ton concrete block and you could say perhaps we're going a bit of overkill um, but we don't want these to uh, fail which we think would be very embarrassing and uh, we want to avoid that if at all possible. Um, so there's a little bit of history of uh, screw anchors, a little bit of what we're doing. Um, we've got lots of new ideas going around. We're talking to lots of people and uh, we just welcome input from users and everybody else. Um, I will now hand over to Robin Williamson of uh, CFlex um, and he'll take on from the top of our screw anchor upwards. Good transition, Richard. Thank you. So now I will share my screen. And I hope it's full screen now. So I am Robin Wilhelmsson working at CFlex. I've been there for six years now. So I'm starting to get a hold of this. Uh, pretty niche business, we must say. So I will take you through this pretty briefly, uh, talk a bit about the company in general, a little bit about the system, which is CFlex, and also touch the subject of the changing times we are in. So company presentation. We did the first CFlex Marina installation in 1975. 
so it is not a new invention, this one. And from 75 to 1990, approximately the focus was only on the domestic market, which is Sweden. And perhaps the yachting industry isn't that big in Sweden, so we started to realize that we should look abroad, which we did. So in 2005, we opened up Seaflex Inc. in California. And by 2010, we had over 95% export of all Seaflex that left the warehouse. In 2013, we created also the Seaflex Energy System with the sole focus on handling renewable energy projects, wave, tidal, you name it. And by 2020, we have approximately 2,000 installations in over 85 countries in the world. So, simple picture of the Seaflex system when it's connected to pontoons, basically connected to the anchor, and then rope covers the depth up to the pontoon connection. This is a simple sketch of how the Seaflex for swing moorings or single point mooring works. Uh, so. The C-Flex can be put on top or closer to the anchor, but we have over the years uh, started to prefer to have it closer to the, to the buoy itself. So basically a connection here to Anchor Islet with a C-Flex shimbal, as we call it, a shackle thimble combination, submerged float on the rope so it doesn't touch the seabed. And then we have the C-Flex units and then rope again up to the actual buoy. And just some pictures to show how, how it can look like when doing an installation. So it's pretty straightforward actually. We see the C-Flex, we have rope, the submerged buoy, and then the rope to cover the depth. And it's basically plug and play. You connect this to the anchor and there you have a, a buoy. This is to show you the design process we do for swing moorings. So this is the top half of the PDS product data sheet, which we provide to our partners or clients. And then they fill in size of boat, how many, if there is a buoy park, for example. And then the environmental information is uh, crucial to receive. So we need to understand what the water level variation is, what the depth is, maximum wind to design for, which goes very much hand in hand with the size of boat to determine uh, what is needed from the Seaflex system. Uh, maximum wave heights and current speed, if there are any. So with this simple foundation, we let our engineers look at uh, the data and offer a design. And this is the Seaflex, so you Oops, so you understand. This is the black rubber hoser here, which are in the units. They are the, the C-Flex. So each one of these black hosers have a brake load of uh, approximately 11 kilonewton. So it's over one ton brake load per hoser. And they can elongate uh, over 100% of the original length. So two meter can become four, four can become eight, etc. Though we do not allow them to elongate that much because when you're starting to get close to the 100% elongation, there are some kind of small material deficits happening, which we kind of lose control, we feel, about the, the system. So therefore, we, the design, we always uh, design for 80% elongation maximum. And also, if we have the bypass system here, uh, that uh, yeah, that that stops the movement or the elongation at eighty percent, so it won't go any further. And this, the yellow ones in the middle, is the bypass system. So it is uh, approximately fifteen ton brake load on that one. So should there be extreme events, we know that the bypass will uh, keep it in place until it it has come down. And then some boring stuff, perhaps, but just we all the metal used in the C-Flex is of high-grade stainless steel. And of course, our 
vision for the future or the, the perfect situation would be to have a C-flex without any metal at all. So we will see when that will happen, but that is a topic. So briefly about where C-flex can be used because I have heard so many stories and rumors and interesting uh, things about C-flex. It can only be used in low variation and warm water or yeah, you, you name it, but there are no real limitation to where it can be used. It's all about uh, understanding the challenges, making a proper design. And then as long as we know that this will hold its weight, then we are happy to offer it. If we are the least unsure about the, the capacity or how CPLEX will handle everything, we will not provide it. So what is C-Flex then? Because it's, you know, it looks like a black rubber cable or hoser, but it's a reinforced elastomer hoser actually. So it's not only rubber, which makes also part of the unique characteristics of the system. And every batch of rubber we receive is tested uh, to ensure that they follow the same characteristics as the C-Flex standard. So there can be one of these black C-Flex holsters up to 10 per unit, depending on the forces acting on, on site, depending on the design. And also the length of the C-Flex can be increased depending on the needs. And it is possible to attach it uh, various ways. So we have the thimble with the rope, we also have a shackle on one side. So that's possible to to play with depending on the needs also for each project. And it's all site specific. So this is just to give you a picture of the C-Flex also. So there is a homogeneous rubber core in the middle. There is cord uh, wrapped around it. And then there is a rubber cover on the top to protect the cord basically. So all the forces gets compressed uh, as it elongates and handle forces. And this is a quick uh, graph showing because one of the unique things about C-Flex is that the progressive force handling curve. So as you see in the beginning with the forces uh, are coming, it's pretty easy. It doesn't need much force to, to elongate further. But then as you come to a certain level, then you will need a lot of load to elongate it even further. So this is what we take into calculation for all our designs. So it should be soft at the start and then it's becoming more and more firm and resistant. And key or main goal is to avoid all kinds of shock loads. Minimize peak loads is really the key. And this is a simple illustration of C-Flex in a swing mooring. And this is for showing the, the traditional way with the chain. And the, these days famous dead spots, which wasn't too many years ago, this wasn't even a topic really. But it's quite clear that this is not the way to do a a mooring park or a buoy park. And here is uh, showing us with a, a helix anchor in this case. And clearly there is minimal impact of the seabed. So then quickly, maybe why one should use C-Flex? Well, it is a technological mooring system. So it's not, not just something that you throw out in the water and you hope it will work fine. It's an engineered solution. And also the dampening characteristics is important to ensure longevity for, 
for both the mooring system itself and also the floating applications and the attachment points because of minimizing peak loads and shock loads. And also our approach is really the long-term economy, which I think one of the reasons we are here today is because of uh, short-sighted thinking about these solutions. You just throw in the chain and everything works, but then I think we are missing some important added values by not destroying the seagrass, seagrass, etc. And quality is also one of the keywords for the company, both in terms of the materials used and the process to determine correct solution. Environment is have been a keyword for us for a long time, and we are very well happy that it's starting to pick up all around the world now. So a brief uh, comparison also to Shane, which is the most traditional way to more and have been for many years. So as I was touching the subject on, C-Flex dampens the loads, which increase the lives of the more application and less in the peak loads. And if used for a pontoon, it's, it is always under tension C-Flex. We want to pre-tension it before locking it into place. So it's even at lowest water level, it is under tension and then it only gets more, more and more tension as the water level rises. And the corrosion is also one thing where we want to and do stand out from the traditional chain. That we, in general, at least two to three times lifetime to the chain for the C-Flex units. But then we also now, well, 2013 actually implemented titanium hybrid models because even though it's named stainless steel, it's not stainless, it will start to corrode. So then we have replaced the thinnest metal parts uh, with titanium. And this uh, really increases the lifespan of, of the units. And in terms of inspections, there are, should be less inspections needed for C-Flex and also easier to do than checking every chain link, basically. And C-Flex always stays off the sensitive seabed. This is every installation, nothing except the anchor itself touches the seabed. Just a few references to give you a general understanding about C-Flex and that it's not, not something new and it's not only possible to do small pontoons or swing moorings. Here we have a project in Dagestan, Russia. I did a couple of years ago with 42 meter uh, water variation. So the black line up here on the mountains is the highest water level. There is a hydropower dam around the corner here. So that's the reason to for this incredible uh, water variation. So we used 25 meter long sea flex for this one. And the depth was over 100 meter also. So the total length of mooring line was over 350 meter for each mooring line. Then we have this beautiful marina in the UK with some swing moorings also around, not all with C-Flex, unfortunately, but the Mylar in Falmouth. Uh, did the solar project in UK just a few years ago and floating solar is really starting to be popular in the world because of uh, a good way to harvest energy and environmentally friendly to a degree, I think. Here we have a Brook Street Pier in Tasmania, Australia. So this is a 5,000 ton floating building, four stories with offices and shops, etc. And this is only moored with C-Flex. And then if people are maybe hesitant about does it work, uh, things like that. Here we have a ho hotel room with C-Flex. And I would think that they don't want to risk their customers to drift away. Another floating solar. And this is a wave energy device we did in Norway, designed for 22 meter waves, uh, handled 18 meter waves the first year, and in 80 meter depth. And then some quick general topics about the advanced mooring system, which is the new name for it here. And it should be several criteria to fulfill to be considered uh, AMS. Because in, for very calm conditions, uh, a simple rope can be used to moor things. 
inside and in a swimming pool perhaps, then you can use a rope. But when out on the water, it's quite important to calculate all the risks. So what the conditions and the forces will uh, or could be, what must the system need to handle? And all main forces derived from the environmental parameters with the wind waves, tidal variation and current, and also the size of the moored object. And the worst case scenario should always be looked at when doing a design. And then it's also good and interesting and important to, to understand how much force is transferred to the attachment points. So there we have some ongoing projects in the UK now that uh, the plan is to, to measure these loads and compare different systems. So that is uh, really positive. And then also how often the system must be amended or fixed or inspected to continue being fit for purpose. So we have a small list of what we think should be expected of an advanced mooring system. It should never be in contact with the seabed. It should minimize releasing pollutants into the ecosystem. It should have a dampening effect to minimize the peak load and avoiding risks for boats breaking loose and things like that. And also to ensure longevity, because we think minimizing the work and the boats, uh, working boats, etc. I mean, longevity is, is good for the environment, it should be as simple as that. And also to ensure security and safety for all parties involved. And I think this is one of the reasons uh, we are here to, to spread the information. Then some inspiration. Uh, I do work with New Zealand quite a bit and they are really now pushing for these environmentally friendly systems. They, yeah, I've heard a lot of information that in the coming years they will be, chain will basically be banned. So that's good. And they also have a one year permit for every swing mooring installed and in use. So it's not possible to just put out the mooring and think that that's your free choice. They need to know uh, if a mooring is, is placed. So certified diving companies need to inspect and document that the mooring system is in good condition every year. So they remove actually the complete mooring and inspect it on land. And then they send their inspection documents to the local council, who then puts it in their official mooring database, you can say. And if the mooring is approved, then it's a 12 month renewal for that mooring until the next year. And a brief summary also, since we have, CFLEX have been in this game for a long time and we have been using environmentally friendly arguments for many years, since the start, really. And then we talk about the 1990s, and we were literally laughed at when, when talking about environmentally friendly. Uh, the added value of C-Flex, that was not something people were interested in. During the 2000s, it wasn't all laughs, but yeah, it wasn't still something important, something that we felt people cared about. But then in 2010s, we started to feel that this we, restrictions were taking place in some countries here and there and more requests to us for environmentally friendly solution. And then now in the 2020s, the start have been really interesting and almost impressive. A great increase of interest. And a lot of this is deriving from initiatives from different governments. So let us do our best to continue this positive attitude and development. Thank you very much. And now passing to, I don't remember, Kate or Mark. It's Kate next, thank you. Thanks very much, uh, Robin, that's brilliant. Uh, yeah, if we can hand over to Kate. Um, hello. <laughs> uh, just checking my video can work. Um, I think I need a permission for it. It's working, Kate. Oh, great. You can all see me. 
Um, yeah, thanks very much, uh, Robin and uh, Richard. It's so interesting um, hearing about these different um, mooring systems and just the kind of technology that goes behind it. And it's it's just so positive um, from our aspect. Um, I'm just going to tell you a little bit um, about the Green Blues involvement um, in the Remedies project um, and have a little bit more of an insight um, from a boater's perspective on mooring with care and, and what we're doing sort of behind the scenes, if you like. So I'm going to do a quick introduction to the Remedies project. Um, I know that Love Day um, did a little bit at the beginning, but for those of you who might have just joined us, um, I'm just going to do a recap of that. Um, I'm also going to go through um, some of the threats that we do have to our seabed habitats. Um, recreational boating activities is just one of those, but there are a variety. Um, and then I'm going to give you an example of one of those types of seabed habitats, which are really important and, and that we need to protect. Um, and then why, why do we need these mooring systems, advanced mooring systems in place? And then I'm going to be sharing with you some um, helpful resources for you as boaters that you can take away um, to continue your journey in helping to protect um, these really important habitats. So in terms of the Life Recreation Remedies project, um, as Love Day mentioned at the beginning, um, it is a four year project and it is looking at reducing and mitigating erosion and disturbance impacts affecting the seabed. There are five key sites that we are focusing on due to the fact that they are in unfavorable condition um, and we're looking pr pr primarily at seagrass and mull beds. Um, and looking at trialing these advanced mooring systems in these locations to learn from them and hopefully be able to share this out further afield around the UK, but also um, across Europe as well. So we've got lots of um, different partners involved in the project. So in terms of the frets, um, obviously this is focusing very much on the recreational boating side of things and, and other boating. Um, particularly around um, how can we come away from anchoring impacts and also improve our, on our traditional swing moorings. Um, but we do acknowledge though that there are other threats to these seabed habitats, such as climate change and temperature rises of the sea, um, and also water level rises, um, agricultural runoff, which is adding nutrients to the water, uh, which is pre preventing seabed habitats um, from um, developing um, and then we also have other recreational impacts such as bait digging, dog walking, um, along with development of our coastline. So there are lots of factors, but the combination of all these together is what's causing um, a decline in these important habitats. And as boaters, if we can do something to minimise that additional impact, that additional threat contributing to this collection, then I think, you know, it's really important that we need to be looking at this, hence why the RWA is involved in the Remedies project, um, to discover ways that we can support recreational boaters in one, um, how can we anchor in a better way to minimise our impact on um, habitats such as seagrass, how can we look at avoiding anchoring in them at all? And in that sense, is advanced mooring systems an option there or can we um, find less sensitive areas to go to? But we want to make sure that we're maintaining freedom of access um, and enjoyment to visit these beautiful areas where these habitats exist. So I just want to give you a background on one of these habitats. Um, and seagrass is talked a lot about. Um, it is a very vulnerable habitat and it is um, in decline in some areas. And, and threatened by all of those factors that I indicated before. But just to give you a background on this type of habitat um, that the uh, Remedies Project in particular is looking at, um, it's uh, seagrass grows in very shallow waters up to sort of 12 metre depth. So there is a potential there um, of um, anchoring impact and moorings systems. Um, it's the only flowering plant in the ocean. It has a root system. So seaweed instead has a kind of anchor that fixes on. Um, a hold fast it's called um, onto rocks for example but this actually has a root system that embeds into the sand. Um, it requires clean sheltered and well-lit areas for growing. Um, because it's in sheltered areas that's an ideal place where we as boaters like to go to shelter from storms or to rest for the evening. So um, unfortunately we have to find some way of um, having some harmony between using these areas as recreational users, but also maintaining such an important habitat 
um, which the ecosystem and area thrives on. Um, and as a boater visiting these places, I want to make sure that they continue to be beautiful. And I know many of you that are on this webinar today also feel that way as well and are looking for solutions, hence why you're interested in finding about these advanced mooring systems. So why are these habitats so important? Why do we want to protect them and put these advanced mooring systems in place? Um, in terms of seagrass, it has been in decline um, globally for some time now. There are pockets obviously um, around the British coastline that um, are in good condition, but unfortunately there are others that aren't. Um, and in some areas, the increase in level of recreational boating in those areas is causing that additional extra pressure um, that we need to try and resolve. But one meter squared of seagrass can produce 10 liters of oxygen per day. And it's actually um, in, in, in more effective in some ways than rainforests um, in producing that oxygen. It's also a great carbon store. Um, and it stores up to 10 to 12% of the world's ocean carbon. So that's really helping to take carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and tackling our climate change issue. Um, in the roots themselves, they have rhizomes, a little bit like our legumes that we grow in the garden, and they fix nitrogen into nitrates, giving nutrients back into the seabed to help the seagrass grow, but also other species. They're also great at protecting our coastline from erosion. So because it's got a root system seagrass, it's binding that sand together a bit like you would have vegetation um, along steep banks um, on land. It's gripping that soil together. So when there's heavy rain, you get less erosion. The same thing is happening um, along the coastline. It's binding the sand together. It's taking the, um, the energy out of any waves coming in um, and helping to maintain our coastlines and our beaches. And then finally, um, and, and not all of the amazing reasons behind this particular habitat, it supports nine of our main fisheries um, types of fish, so such as herring, pollock, place. So the things we like to eat in terms of um, seafood, these are um, great habitats to, um, for nursery grounds for these species and also for resting um, and breeding, etc. So going back to the threats, in terms of recreational boating, it seemed to be um, the actual traditional swinging moorings and the anchoring itself. So if we um, can try and limit or avoid anchoring these seagrass beds, what are the alternative options? So it's looking at how we're actually anchoring um, as well. And it is also looking at these advanced mooring systems. And from the previous two presentations, you can see that this is really a good way forward. Um, to allow us as a boating community to continue accessing these amazing places um, whilst also minimising the impact. And you can see down here in the left hand corner, um, this is in St Mary's in the Isles of Scilly, which is one of the focus sites of the project. And you can um, see there the impact that swinging moorings are happening. And um, as Robin mentioned, um, you know, these, these dead spots, if you like. So, uh, from um, a point of view of protecting this habitat, habitat and increasing the abundance, then looking at these advanced boring systems is definitely a way forward and the ROA is keen for these trials to go ahead and see how effective they can be. So um, in terms of advanced boring systems, obviously the two previous presentations are giving you some really good um, explanations about what those are and some examples. Um, and Robin gave some um, really good um, indications of the positives behind them when you're looking at security of your vessel, the protection of the seabed, durability, etc. maintenance. Um, so here's just um, a few of those that we're pulling out of that. And, and I think some of the key questions which we can already, already see coming up in the chat is, OK, how much is this going to cost me? Do I need it for my type of mooring? Um, I do feel that some moorings out there are probably over-engineered for the type um, of size of vessel and actually a smaller mooring um, in terms of less chain, less size of concrete um, or granite block um, for the anchor is maybe not needed for the type of boat, especially on personal moorings. Um, so it's looking at one, our existing moorings and what they are and can we, can we redo those, but also looking at these kind of more technologically advanced ones. Um, this is a diagram just to show you some of the examples of the different ones. Um, 
obviously some of the, um, some diagrams have already been presented to you and those videos that Robin showed you were really, really good to give you that kind of visual sense of what's going on underneath the water. Um, but just to um, go over that, currently we have our traditional swing moorings. Um, again, it's a block anchor on the bottom and they come in various different shapes and sizes, but the block itself takes up space on the seabed where habitat could um, be growing instead. And especially when we're looking at seagrass, it needs sand because a lot of people come back saying, well, the block itself might create a habitat for species to attach to. But in terms of seagrass habitat, it won't help that particular species to grow. And then you've got the chain itself, which unfortunately um, creates a pivot area and abrades around that um, anchor point. Um, so that's what we're trying to look at is how can we reduce the actual anchor size that's impacting on the seabed surface? How can we lift that chain off or remove it um, so it's not causing that abrasion, but also still maintaining that security for your boat? Um, many um, boaters will ask um, about the security level and how do I know it's going to hold my weight of boat? Um, and it's looking at the traditional moorings that we already moor to, so if you're visiting a site and you moor up, how do you know that that mooring is safe to secure your boat on? What indications give you that? Is it pure trust that whoever's installed it has gone through the proper measures? Um, therefore, when it comes to an advanced mooring system that has all the technological um, measurement behind it and can tell you exactly what load it can hold, um, if somebody is going to be familiar if it's a harbour or a marina, then there should be security and trust behind that as well, and, pro and probably more so compared to maybe um, a, a tire with um, concrete inside, which again, like I was saying, is probably far more engineered than you need to, so it creates a larger area of impact on the seabed. Um, but if anyone has any examples of reasons why they find their traditional swinging moorings when they moor up, if you can't see what's under the water, the reason why you trust that may be over an advanced mooring system that might be under the water. Um, interesting um, discussion there. Um, so from the Remedies Project, um, the Green Blue as the Environmental Awareness Programme for the RWA, but also British Marine, we've developed a guide to support you as boat users on best practice around anchoring and then an introduction to moorings. Um, this guide is available on the Green Blue website. Um, I will be putting up a link to that in the chat so you can um, go there straight away and download it. It has been a really popular guide. It's probably our most popular at the moment. Um, and it definitely shows people have got an interest in wanting to protect their environment. So that's fantastic. Um, so I will be putting a link up into that. Um, just to let you know, um, a lot of people turn around and say, well, if we're going to be trying to avoid anchoring in these places, regardless of advanced mooring systems, how do we know where these seagrass beds are? Um, what we're doing behind the scenes, um, the ROA, is looking at getting the data of where these seagrass beds are to put into um, the data for the hydrographic office. So chart software companies can download that and that will be from their choice as a chart software company to get that data and put it on their charts. And from our point of view, we'll be encouraging them to do so. We're also working really closely with Imray because we're gonna be putting information into the pilotage book, book sorry, where you choose um, uh, to anchor. So the anchorage, anchorage information, we're gonna have a little bit more information there about any habitats that might be located and also looking at the paper charts through them. Then what we'd really like is club centers and marinas to be having these maps um, or um, shots of these locations in their local waters and displaying them actually on their sites but also on their websites to help their customers and members identify where they are and visitors. And of course as part of the project we are going to be helping develop those so your support um, would be great with that. Um, just um, to indicate a couple of online maps that you can use to go and find out where your local seagrass areas are um, and other habitats as well. We've got the um, MPA reality check. MPA stands for Marine Protected Area. So um, you can go on that again. The, the link is at the bottom here, but I'll put it in the chat as well. So you can go and explore around the UK and zoom in and out and find some of these sites. And you'll see down in the bottom left hand corner there, you can tick a box that says seagrass under broad scale habitats. The next one, um, so another one you can use is the National um, 
um, Biodiversity Network Atlas. Again, you go in there, it's an interactive map. You do have to look up eelgrass, seagrass to draw up that particular species. Um, and then you again can zoom in and find those locations. So if you're out boating and you do want to find out where these sites are to maybe try and avoid them um, and think about your anchoring best practice, then do use these in the meantime. And finally, um, I just want to make you all aware that we do have some upcoming webinars where we're going to be talking more about um, seagrass habitats and the anchoring best practice in particular. So 8th and 22nd of April, if you want to register, follow the EU Life Remedies on social media and the Green Blue, but you can also go to the Green Blue website because we've got our Join Our Webinars page where we put up all our upcoming webinars and we also have past ones on there for you to watch as and when you feel. Um, or just drop me a line at info at thegreenblue.org and I'm happy to answer any questions and, and share that information. Um, and that's it from me, thank you. Love day, I presume this goes to me now. It does indeed. Yes, please, Mark. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Kate. Uh, brilliant presentation. We'll hear from Mark Parry from the Ocean Conservation Trust now. Let me share my screen with you all. Thanks for having me along. And um, uh, you will recognise that uh, I work for the same organisation that uh, Love Day does. I work for the Ocean Conservation Trust. My name's Mark Parry and I am the development officer for the uh, for the Ocean Conservation Trust. Now I, I guess uh, mooring systems or eco mooring systems and now commonly referred to as advanced mooring systems is a slightly odd place for a, an aquarium and a conservation charity to be uh, involved in or space to to uh, occupy but um, what we really wanted to do was get involved in the conversation of the proliferation and the adoption of advanced mooring systems no matter really what they are and our uh, involvement in in uh, moorings became came about when in 2014 when we were working with the Sulcombe Harbour Master in South Devon and they had a um, a opportunity where they needed to move two moorings from what was uh, a private uh, foreshore into deeper deeper water and uh, that was within the seagrass bed so having worked closely with the harbour authority and the AONB in that area there seemed to be a, an opportunity to trial a, a, an eco-friendly mooring now working with the harbour authority the uh, assistant harbour master at the time was Cameron Sim Sterling, and um, he's now um, the harbour master. And uh, that's where the name the Sterling Advanced Mooring comes from, because the harbour authority was looking for a reasonably cheap and um, effective solution to mooring in seagrass beds. So coming at this from an ecologist and we've had quite a bit of uh, technical help along the way and various iterations, I'll start the conversation or this presentation with a little bit about seagrasses because it's my area of expertise and having worked with the OCT now for seven years, uh, it's, it's uh, my focus is seagrasses. And um, then we'll move on to the advanced mooring systems that we've, we've had installed. So seagrasses have an ecological and socio-economic importance. They provide ecosystem services for um, just trying, yeah, they provide ecosystem services for the human population, the coastal population. And ecosystem services are benefits um, from, uh, from our coastal ecosystems that uh, make life possible and, and worth living. And there are four broad categories that these ecosystem services can fall into with regards to seagrass meadows in the UK. Seagrass meadows globally act as a carbon sink and the conversations that we started at uh, seven years ago with regards to um, seagrasses were very much about umbrella species and and um, all of the uh, the wonderful and rare 
uh, animals that these uh, habitats provide home for. But over the course of that seven years, and I think Robin uh, touched on it, he, the conversation between mooring holders and the significance on, on coastal habitat seems to be changing, which is great. And uh, it's really encouraging that uh, coast or care of our, our coastal habitats is, is becoming a significant, uh, a significant on the agenda. Um, they also provide nursery for commercial fish species. So it's one of the points that we try to uh, we, that we try to emphasize. And Kate picked up on that within her presentation that there is seagrass provide nursery and a huge amount of support for our offshore fisheries without the nursery or hatchery for many of the fish that end up within our fish markets, then we see a knock on effect of that. And that's why the Ocean Conservation Trust uh, is interested in, in being involved in this conversation. And then it goes back to the threatened species or threatened or protected species, these umbrella species um, worldwide that seagrass uh, um, use as as home or foraging grounds. So within the UK, famously, it's seahorses, but further afield, it's um, uh, dugongs uh, or turtles, and um, it's a primary producer. And a little bit uh, less what we hear about is coastal defences. So it's it's amazing. It's sort of um, dampening wave action that then has a knock-on effect to um, coastal erosion. So to put all of these ecological and social economic importance into to quantify that, the most recent estimate is that per hectare of seagrass the net worth is about 19,000 US dollars and interestingly that study that was published in Nature only really considered the nitrogen stripping capabilities of seagrasses, not necessarily the fishery support nor the uh, sediment stabilization or the carbon value. And it's, it's something that we're hearing increasingly a lot about carbon. And seagrasses are fantastic at storing carbon in, in, in a quite a different way than our terrestrial habitats do. And uh, they were valued more than mangrove salt marshes and tropical rainforests through this stacking of uh, ecosystem services. So since the 1990s, it's estimated that there's a 9% uh, decline in global seagrasses. And since the 1930s, uh, we've experienced a 92% loss worldwide. And that includes Zostra marina, which is the, uh, the predominant species within the Northern Hemisphere. And when we turn the conversation to carbon, and just purely carbon, uh, that equates to 10.6 megatons of stored carbon, which has a trading value of about 275 million. So there is a reason that this, within the climate emergency, that uh, carbon is becoming the, the hot topic because there are less competing land uses in trying to restore our coastal vegetative habitats. But not only do we lose that, uh, that it's really the, the, the cherry on the top of the cake, we're losing our food resource and habitat for, for some of our commercial fish or many of our commercial fish. So what are our threats? Um, they're natural, there are natural threats um, as well as anthropogenic effects. And there's been a lot of work that has been done through the Water Framework Directive and invasive species to, uh, um, in, well, to endeavor to protect these habitats and uh, look after them. And uh, there's also direct physical damage as well. So the adoption of any uh, advanced mooring system or anything that uh, that reduces this, uh, as, as Robin said, this dead zone and allows for a, a growth around the, the anchor, whether that be a concrete block or whether that be a pin um, with, with Richard's examples of uh, anchors, then that only that can only be a positive thing. Um, in, sea, in the UK, we've got three different types of seagrass or, or three species of seagrass. We've got uh, Zostra anglophosphola, Noltii and Zostra marina. I guess from a, from a boater's perspective and from a mooring perspective, 
our primary concern is the reduction of zostra marina. And we find that in estuarine and subtidal zones. And it's also known as eelgrass because when you look down in, from, from the surface and it's waving around in the current, it sort of looks like eels. So the adoption, the adoption of, of eco-friendly or advanced mooring systems, no matter what the, uh, what the method is, what the riser is, has a huge amount of impact on the conservation of, uh, of this habitat. So we've, we've conducted trials with regards to the length of the riser and what, I'm, uh, what, what this slide really refers to is uh, a standard mooring configuration and a nine meter chain, uh, the sphere of influence of that because of the fall and rise of the tide is about five meters. So within five meters, then um, the, uh, the area of a circle uh, is uh, pi r squared. So we see an influence in fact, or a dead zone of about 70, 79 square met meters squared. Um, but just reducing and taking into account the effect of the riser, regardless of the block, if we can reduce that to a uh, radius of uh, 0.5 metres or 50 centimetres, we have a 99% reduction on the impact that we're having on that habitat. And when it's uh, considered to be one of the most valuable habitats on the, uh, on the face of the earth, um, that's a really, really easy win. And then with the adoption of a helical anchor, it reduces it down to the size of pin or um, the, the, um, the, uh, the diameter of the uh, helical screw, which is very little, uh, possibly as much as uh, five to 10 centimeters across. So there are incremental wins here, but the adaptation or the adoption of, of moorings allows for an enormous reduction within the effect of, uh, of moorings, especially in sensitive habitats with, with regards to non-sensitive habitats and it's less of a thing to worry about. But when we, we think about uh, the loss of these sensitive habitats and the value of these sensitive habitats, then adopting this type of technology is, is quite an easy win really. Um, so just to talk about the, uh, the trial that uh, the Ocean Conservation Trust have been involved in is uh, within Corsan Bay. So significant eelgrass meadow within Plymouth Sound, areas are a bit patchy and there's a chart here on the uh, right hand side and the darker the, the colour then the more dense the seagrass is and therefore the greater the um, uh, the coverage or, or denser the, the plants are. The principal pressure placed upon seagrasses within the European marine site, and I also sit part of uh, remedies, um, is so what we're endeavouring to do is reduce pressures on the feature of the European marine designation or the special area of conservation. And it's been, des or it's been identified as, as mooring scour from recreational boating. So it's one of the things that we've been trying to, um, trying to work to find a solution with. So alternative mooring solutions, the advanced mooring system, as, uh, as Booverly said, it wasn't something that we consciously got involved in. It was the Salcombe Harbour Authority that uh, asked us to trial some, some different techniques and also monitor that. So our first, uh, our first deployment um, was in Salcombe Harbour and we worked with the Harbour Authority to work out what that design might look like. It took place in 2014 and it took place for three years. The second deployment was in Corsan Bay two years later in 2016 and, and that lasted for two years. And the third deployment uh, is uh, also within Corsan Bay and fits within the, the Remedies project. That uh, was installed in 2019 and that will run for three years. And recently we've had uh, the Yarmouth Harbour Authority uh, also adopt a, a trial on some of the uh, sort of chain moorings that they've got just outside the harbour there. And that's been funded as part of the EU Life Remedies project. Um, what does the mooring look like? What does the sterling mooring look like? So we worked with the Harbour Authority to try and come up with a solution that they could 
uh, potentially change themselves. They could retrospectively fit. And in the event that uh, there was a, um, a degradation or, or um, a corrosion of some of the some of the components, it was something that they could change themselves. And some of the uh, previous recommendations from UK uh, other conservation charities was why doesn't someone try to to lift the chain off the ground? Now it started very much as a um, quite a Heath Robinson design. The Harbour Authority were were um, on board with that and. But subsequently, various different iterations. We've had Babcock uh, uh, be involved with the or participate with the boy spacings. And whilst it looks like a bunch of boys on a chain, um, it, it's slightly more. There's there's a, a little bit of an art to it in balancing that chain to to get it off the ground. And primarily, our interests were looking after the sensitive habitat that were on the on the seabed. Um, and it worked because the impacts of the SAMs after two years deployed in Sulcombe was that there was no negative feedback. We observed uh, seagrass growth around the advanced mooring system and that was supported by Plymouth University and all of the mm -hmm. monitoring was done with uh, their scientific uh, dive team and subsequently the, the uh, findings of that were um, uh, published within within nature, within scientific reports, which is an online uh, online um, uh, point of access to nature. And it was a simplistic mooring modification, reducing the impacts on seagrass meadows. And uh, Luff et al published that in 2019. And with regards to the deployment in core sands, 18 months after, after install, uh, the reports are that the, uh, the, the um, riser and the uh, the anchor and what we were required to do was install uh, helical screws within that deployment they're all in good order we've had five uh, frequent users uh, mooring to those some of well one is no, in fact two are commercial operators and there's been no negative feedback but coming at this from a conservation angle, the, the three moorings uh, have shown positive seagrass growth. One has shown a decline and, and one has very much stayed the same. Um, the whole trial has been, been funded through the Marine Conservation Society uh, with primary sort of, uh, cash injection from Princess. And it's a trial of a, a novel mooring design and as previously mentioned, it, um, sorry, Love Days texting me. Ah. Um, it was a trial of a, of a no novel mooring design that uh, fulfilled some of the requirements of the Harbour Authority and the requirements of the boat users. We spoke to the boat users, we understood what, uh, what gauge chain was, uh, was required and subsequently we provided the midwater floats to those. Uh, installation within October 2018 failed and subsequently we went back the, the following year and um, approached it with a different, uh, uh, a, a different team and we found that using surface su supplied divers to install the helical the helical pins were or the helical screws helices uh, was, was considerably more successful within our approach. Um, so I was fortunate enough to get on the water on Monday and um, you can see this, well this is core sands and this is the ABC anchor reduced, uh, it deployed to a four metre depth and the amount of torque or the, 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 the pull out strength of that is uh, 12 tonnes. With a, with a safe working load of six. Uh, but you can see in the forefront there, we've got uh, seagrass growing close to the pin. And we've also got uh, um, peacock worm growing very close to the pin. If that was a traditional mooring, we wouldn't get that type of, that type of life growing around it. And I suppose, you know, from an advocate of, of conservation, it really doesn't matter 
what eco-friendly mooring is or advanced mooring system is adapted or, or adopted what we really want to focus upon is is the care of the sensitive habitat and i think the um the the presence of that feathery worm down the bottom there which is its feeding appendages uh, demonstrates that uh, these things can make a difference and they can make our, our coastal systems better so again uh, there's some healthy seagrass growing took this on monday afternoon so it's uh, it's within its dormant stages we'd hope that over the course of the of the summer we'd see more growth the important thing is is that the root structures there the rhizome structures there and our um, advanced mooring system isn't scouring that out and it's allowing the seagrass to uh, recruit into that area and become the dominant uh, the dominant habitat type which it is a a primary producer for all of the other ecosystem things that I discussed. Uh, that's very close to the pin, can't see the pin, but in March that's uh, that's very healthy seagrass. Uh, we'd like to see it a little bit denser and hopefully over the course of time and course of the trial we'll see that uh, uh, more recruitment and, and more vegetative growth. And um, finally, I, I mentioned that this isn't uh, um, it looks like a, a, a pile of boys strapped to a chain um, and it's it's become a little bit more sophisticated than that. What we're looking for is the catenary within the spacing of each boy to balance that to dampen the uh, the effect of any uh, any boat vest uh, moored upon it and uh, that actually has our, do our dive boat moored to it which is a nine ton um, nine ton uh, dive boat and one of our divers there and kindly uh, kindly donated by another one of our dive volunteers uh, that's what it looks like under the water with a with a more with a boat moored to it um so yeah long way well uh much conversation to have about the adoption and the um uh um building trust within advanced mooring systems but no matter what, uh, what um, uh, method of riser is adopted, there's a net gain for nature, which is, which is the primary reason that we are on remedies. And, and I think all of the other people um, involved in this are, are here. Um, interestingly, just jumping back to that picture, um, Richard mentioned quite early on that it's over-engineered and we deployed that uh, helical pin or the, the helical screw pile he sees to four meters with a 12 12 ton pull out whereas in the balearics and there's a huge amount of seagrass uh, protection and conservation going on in the balearics uh, they swim down on one breath hold and deploy a helical uh, or a screw pile pin down to the depth of about 30 centimeters and they're more than happy to have their boat uh, uh, anchored on that, albeit that uh, it's obviously very different uh, environmental conditions, but it just shows what's possible if, if we have a belief. So thanks very much for listening. And if anybody has any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Brilliant. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, and thanks, everybody. Uh, that was an amazing presentation there from all of our, our panellists. Uh, a real good range of, of, of information and a lovely message to start to end on there that really whichever system we choose, whichever whatever we're putting it in, I like that net gain for nature. That's a that's a lovely way of putting it. Fantastic. Um, brilliant. So we have had a few questions coming in uh, from uh, everyone. Uh, I am aware we've gone a bit over time. So for everyone that's still with us, thank you so much for sticking around with us in the evening. Uh, I'm aware it's tea time, so we'll get on to our, our questions quite quickly. Um, we do have a couple that were sent in beforehand. Actually, our panellists have been doing a fantastic job of, um, of uh, answering questions as we've gone along. So lots that have been coming in throughout the webinar. Uh, hopefully we've managed to, to answer for you. And uh, we'll, we'll actually answer a few that came in on, the, on our registrations. Uh, so for anyone uh, of our panellists who wants to jump in and answer, uh, just uh, go for it. We're not going to feel the out uh, to specific people. Uh, so uh, someone has written in saying uh, they're looking for a suitable AMS solution for a six plus metre tidal range in a high density mooring estuary. 
uh, are our solutions that we've talked about today, uh, do, they, do they sound suitable for that sort of uh, environmental condition? Yes. Well, that was quickly answered. Yes, uh, it answers your question if you're still there, Joe. Uh, your, your question was a good one and yes <laughs> is the answer. Fantastic. Um, another question here. Realistically, how long would it take uh, to see more advanced mooring systems in place than traditional ones? Uh, how long is this project? I mean, obviously, Remedies, we know, is a four-year project, but how long would it take to actually replace all of those traditional moorings uh, with AMS? Who wants to jump in there? I can try, but that is uh, difficult to pinpoint the answer to that question, but uh, it seems quite far away. The impression, because I, the New Zealand thing I had in my presentation, I had regular meetings with him in the latest weeks, this is our partner, and he said that only in their bay there are thousands of moorings, and that's one bay out of many, many. And now with the pressure from government, they he thinks in the coming five years, something like that, they will not allow a chain mooring to go out after the 12 month uh, renewal. So he thinks that area will be, can we talk about five, 10 years perhaps, and then maybe 50, 50 or something like that. But there are quite many chain moorings around in the world. Okay, for it, Mark. Yeah, thanks. Thanks for that, Robin. Mark, did you want to add something? I, I guess the um, the time frame is is dictated by the users, isn't it? If if the users are happy and satisfied with the um, with the specifics that uh, CFlex or or any other mooring provider can uh, can supply, and if there's a conscious decision for that individual mooring holder to um, to adopt that then or request it then it's more of a rather than a top-down change a, a bottom-up change which is in my opinion probably the best way to politically do things <laughs> so um, come on we can we can uh, we can drive for a uh, more sustainable use of our coastal coastal systems yeah, that's great. Thanks, thanks, guys. Um, Kate, uh, did you have something to add to that as well? Uh, yeah, no, no, yeah, I do agree with that. Um, and obviously, with the work we're doing with the Remedies project, it's it's the kind of confidence behind those who are installing the moorings, it, be it a personal mooring or be it a marina that is installing it. Um, but hopefully, from this project, um, more confidence will come from that, um, and momentum will start to build. Um, and and we can say from the R way that these mooring systems are really, really good. Um, and we're looking forward to more data and more results coming out of it to prove that. And, and hopefully um, then it's a case of looking at funding of these um, and getting them in place and, and the kind of costs around that. And if there is, um, if there are individuals or, um, um, or clubs, for example, that may have moorings, it's looking at how those can be funded going forwards. Um, to enable this. Brilliant, thanks Kate. Uh, Mark, did you want to jump back in again? Sorry, just one more point and I think the last time I uh, met Robin within uh, when he came over to the AMS workshop in Plymouth, uh, I think he summed it up with the point that people just need to adopt these. They are, they are sound, they're safe, let's just get them in and, and let's get a positive feedback of, of, these, uh, of these AMS. Brilliant, great message, that's fantastic. Um, there is another one here, a little bit of a different one. What uh, can be done to protect Studland Bay from the ever-increasing leisure boat traffic? Um, I don't know if Kate wanted to jump in on that one. Yes, go for it, Kate. Um, so obviously, um, the RWA um, are supporting um, boaters and clubs in the area and there's consultation going on at the moment. Um, and RWA response will have gone out either uh, today or tomorrow around that because um, they have been having meetings with the MMO. But in, in terms of areas where you do have these protected habitats and high amounts of boats is trying to come up with a management solution around it and making sure that everybody's included in that process um, in trying to figure it out. The, the sort of feedback when we are talking to boaters is they want to protect these habitats. 
um, but also, you know, be able to have some some freedom of access to be able to enter these areas. So the kind of management around that is probably installing these advanced mooring systems um, to enable that high number of boaters into that area, but having minimal impact so they don't have to anchor as much. Um, looking at voluntary, so making sure things are kept voluntary with um, boaters in terms of uh, no anchor zones, but then also having sort of designated areas where um, boaters can anchor if, if that's the option that they want to use. Um, but it is important also to have education around it. And this is, of course, where the Green Blue comes in, where we have this anchoring and mooring guide um, and working with clubs and centres in one, building that confidence around the advanced mooring systems that are being put in place. And I know in Stublin, 10 are getting put in place by boat folk, which is fantastic. And they're using the helical screw. Um, Richard, <laughs> I'm sure you can uh, back me up with that. Um, and, um, and that's a marina that is embracing sustainability and um, wanting to make sure its operations are sustainable. We want more and more marinas to be taking this on and going, yes, let's do this and put them in. Um, one, because they know going forwards, we need to protect these habitats because if boating, as someone mentioned, with the increase in COVID, especially this year, a lot more people are staying at home for boating and the pressure's increasing. So we must find a solution to this and we must start acting on it um, uh, to protect it and um, find a way through this. But it is a case of having the, all the options available, but not only having these, you know, advanced mooring systems, um, you know, voluntary anchor zones, areas where you can anchor and having the education, it's important that we monitor it as well going forwards to um, look at how is it, how are these management methods um, improving the area? Maybe they're not. And allowing for that adaptation to happen going forwards and learning from, from it. But I think that ongoing monitory is needed and, um, and the funding in, to enable all of this kind of ha to happen as well. Brilliant, that's fantastic, Kate. Thanks for that uh, very, very um, detailed answer. That's brilliant. Um, we are sort of running very over time, so I don't think everyone does need to, to head off. So I think we'll just do one more question. Uh, and then, as we mentioned earlier, if anyone does have any questions we haven't got to that you're desperate to get answered, please do send them into remedies at oceanconservationtrust.org and we will send them out to the relevant person. Um, but just one last question live while we're here. Uh, we had earlier, um, someone was wondering uh, about the mooring pull test demonstrations, those results uh, where they were obtained from. I think this came up during uh, Richard's um, uh, presentation. Uh, I'm just wondering, they're wondering where that, uh, where the results were obtained from and if they were available to the public, if they were public uh, the domain sort of data. Uh, yeah, they, um, uh, they are on YouTube. Um, it takes a little bit of digging out. i uh, see if I can find them again and uh, let you have a link so that you can pass that around to everybody. But um, uh, as I said, you, you could see uh, some of the tests and the amount of black smoke coming out of the old boat trying to pull the moorings out. Brilliant. That's fantastic. Um, that's great, everybody. Um, thank you so much to everyone that's come along on, on a Thursday evening to listen to, to us. We're always just so uh, thrilled to see how many people do turn out to listen to something we're all really passionate about. We have a, a massive interest in. It's lovely to know that there's other people out there uh, ready to listen and, and to take it all in as well. So thank you so much for coming. Um, remember to send any extra questions you have to, to that email address. It's popped up in the chat uh, a few times there. Um, we do also have a feedback uh, form, a survey monkey form going out after this, so it will take you directly to it. If it's a bit late now and you think, oh, I don't want to do a feedback form right now on my Thursday evening, don't worry, it will come in an email, a uh, follow-up email to you as well. So you'll have an opportunity a little bit later on to fill that in, but we really do appreciate your feedback. It's fantastic to hear from, from all of you. And uh, look out for the next webinar. We do have an episode four coming uh, next month, so keep a lookout for that one. Uh, register, come along, listen, uh, and find out more about the Life Recreation Remedies Project. Uh, big thank you to everyone that's come along, and a big thank you to all of our wonderful panelists uh, for sharing uh, their expertise. It's been wonderful to, wonderful to hear from all of them. Uh, and we'd like to say good night. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you. See you thank later. You. Thank you.